Now, another phrase that drives me nuts is, the good is the enemy of the, of the great. The good is not the enemy of the great. The good is the friend of the great. Because if I let myself be just good enough at these things, that gives me the, the bandwidth to be great at the things that really matter. That was Gail Golden, and you're listening to episode 242 of the Building Psychological Strength podcast, where we uncover the information, tools, and techniques to turn our mind into our most valuable asset. The courage to face fears with persistence. Being able to be present enough in this moment to choose my response thoughtfully. We have the strength to bend to life stressors, to bend to adversity without snapping, without breaking. There are only six things that contribute to our quality of life, and they are all experiences. In every moment, we are deciding who we want to be and how we want to live our lives. Noticing what your brain is doing and then being able to make choices mobilize the things that we know lift us up. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to this episode of the Building Psychological Strength Podcast. My name is April, and I'm your host. You are in for a treat this week, a serious treat. This is probably one of my favorite episodes that I have done in a very long time because we're talking about a topic that is so near and dear to my heart, I just can't even stand it. I'm so excited. Every once in a while, as I'm out there on the internets, I come across someone that becomes the focus of my laser beam that they must be on this podcast. And that's what happened when I stumbled across this week's guest. I heard her on another podcast. I heard her message. I learned about her book, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And I knew that I needed to bring her on an episode of this podcast because of how powerful the message she has is. This week's guest is Dr. Gail Golden. She is the author of the book, Curating Your Life, Ending the Struggle for Work-Life Balance. You know why I'm excited about her. Talk about a beautiful companion or another way of thinking about life design. The whole reason why I got excited about life design is it's all about figuring out what makes you tick, figuring out what's meaningful to you, figuring out what you personally want and crafting your life around it. What I love about Gail's book is she gives this beautiful analog for how to do that, specifically around curating your life in a way that is similar to the way a museum curator would curate an exhibit. In this episode, she talks about that whole process, including things like deciding what's important to you. What is your exhibit going to be about? She talks about saying no, deciding what doesn't belong in your exhibit. And you have to listen. If you don't listen to anything else in this episode, which you should listen to the whole thing because it's all so good, but listen to the part about saying no. She goes into something in her book that no one else does. If you've been told and given the advice, oh, you need to say no to things so that you make room for other things and you just haven't been able to put it into practice, this, what she talks about in this episode and what she goes over in her book is probably why. She also talks about embracing mediocrity and when that's a good idea versus choosing greatness and when we should do that. This process of curation is one that is so profoundly powerful. I knew I needed to get Gail on this podcast, and I'm so thrilled that she was here for this episode. To give you just a little bit of background and cred on Gail, Gail is the principal of Gail Golden Consulting, and as a psychologist and a consultant for over 25 years, she has developed deep expertise in helping businesses build better leaders. During the front half of her career, Gail spent her time as a clinical psychologist. Specifically, she was chief psychologist of Golden Psychology Services in London, Ontario, where she supervised a team of mental health professionals who provided a wide range of services, including psychological assessments, treatment, and consulting to organizations. So what you got today is that perfect combo, you know, in my humble opinion, 
a person who is so skilled and so knowledgeable in the field of psychology with, al- with also an understanding of how to help people apply those principles and then a deep understanding in life design or life curation. This episode is one that you are not going to want to miss. You're going to want to share it with other people. You're going to want to pass this one around to your friends. If you like this episode, please drop us a rating and a review on iTunes. I would really appreciate it. And do listen to the end or visit this episode description to find out how you can get a copy of Gail's incredibly powerful book. I've read every word in it and have loved it. So I would urge you to check out those links as well. Without further ado, let's meet Dr. Gail Golden. Gail Golden, I am so thrilled that you're here on this episode of the podcast. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You know, the wonderful thing about the internet and this podcasting world we live in is that you stumble upon and meet the most incredible people. And I stumbled across you and your amazing book on another podcast that I listened to. And it was one of those things where I think you maybe had been speaking for 30 seconds and I'm like, she has to come. I have to get her. I have to find her. So I know this is going to be a really great conversation for this audience. I would love to start. You wrote this incredible book called uh, Curating Your Life, Ending the Struggle for Work-Life Balance. And you, in your book, make so many points that, I don't know, maybe others have hit like a surface level of them, but you go to a depth and to a level of expertise and thoughtfulness that next to no one has gone to in these areas. And I would love to hit some of the big ones in our conversation. Number one. You talk in this book about the importance of managing energy, not time. That's yes. not what we typically hear. Tell me a little bit about what you mean by that. Well, that's a, a brilliant idea that I wish I had come up with. <laughs> but in fact, I learned it from a book that I recommend to everybody called The Power of Full Engagement, uh, which was written by two guys, Lower and Schwartz. And they were talking about they were working as coaches for world-class athletes who were unable to perform at their peak. They had fallen off their game and trying to figure out how to help them get back to what they were capable of doing. And out of that coaching work, they developed a system that they then applied to what they called corporate athletes, people in high stress, high visibility, business leadership roles. And one of their fundamental principles is you can't manage time. Mm. You get 24 hours a day. There is nothing you can do about it. It just keeps coming. It's, it's completely unreasonable to talk about managing time. Mm-hmm. What you can manage, what you do have control over is your energy. And there are two parts to that. One is how you live so as to maximize the capacity that you have, that you have the most energy that you could. But even if you're doing everything right, you're eating your vegetables and you're sleeping eight hours a night and you're meditating daily and doing all of those good things, you're still going to have a finite amount of energy. Mm -hmm. And so then the second half of the equation is how do you direct that energy? How do you focus that energy on the things that really matter and not fritter it away on things that are relatively unimportant. And where that has led me is to say, okay, so when somebody asks me to do something, I don't say to myself, do I have time to do that? I say to myself, do I want to spend my energy on that? It's that a different was question. Pivotal right there. Yeah. It leads to different answers and to much more, because you know what, if you say to me, can I do something? And I say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm not doing anything between two and two thirty in the morning. I could squeeze it in there. Right. <laughs> You're exactly um, right. That's but exactly spend, right. Do I want to spend my energy on that? And then there's a follow up question, which is if if I'm going to do more of this new thing, what am I going to do less of? Because I'm already at peak capacity. I'm all, I don't sit around wondering what to do with myself. My energy is fully mm-hmm. utilized already. So if I'm going to add something, what am I going to take away? What am I going to do less of? And if I can't answer that, what I'm willing to do less of in order 
to do this thing, then I can't do it because my energy is finite. That's amazing. Just the just the realization and the acceptance of the fact that we have a limited amount of energy, I think is a critical thing for people to just pause on for a moment. It sounds good, right? Everyone, oh, of course, of course, of course. And then we get into practice Mm -hmm. and we see ourselves doing things like not taking breaks. Uh, P.S. If you, if you read Gail's book, she makes you take breaks. She puts it in her book. She's like, put the book down and go for a walk right now. It's wonderful. But we don't. We won't take breaks. We go until we're exhausted. We log in too late. We skip meals, skip workouts, skip all of the things that we know, <clears throat> fill up our cup and help us renew our energy. And when it gets into practice, it's like all of that notion of I have limited energy goes out the window. And when we're not performing, in the way that we want to, or we're, we're, you know, feeling like friction in a relationship, or we're snapping back at someone, or we're having a difficult time, we get hard on ourselves as though we should have been able to perform like Michael Phelps with literally no preparation whatsoever. Right, right. And, and furthermore, Michael Phelps, who was the greatest in the world at what he did, I bet you there were a whole lot of things he wasn't doing because he was spending eight hours a day in the pool becoming the greatest swimmer in the world. Right. He wasn't, you know, learning how to make souffles or becoming a great ice skater or fostering 17 children. I doubt it because his energy was going into that thing that was his greatness. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And then you talked a bit in just a moment ago, you mentioned making this decision about what is going to get your energy or basically making the decision based on energy versus time and what's going to get your energy and then what you're going to take away. Mm -hmm. The way that you describe that process in the book is such a beautiful analog. You talk about it with the term curation. Can you talk about where that term came from and what it looks like in practice? Sure. I mean, to be honest, I think I latched onto the term because it was a very trendy word at the time that I started writing the book. People (laughs) were having, you know, curated collections of uh, uh, makeup that's sent to you every month or, you know, wine or whatever. That curation was all around. It's still a very popular word, actually. Um, And I just, one day I started thinking about What if we thought about managing our energy in our lives the way a a curator thinks about his or her job? And and I guess the image I used most was that of a museum curator. Mm. So I worked for some big art museum somewhere, and the, and the, the, the president of the museum comes and says to me, Gail, I want you to curate. I don't really do this. I'm imagining. I want you to, to curate this exhibit. The first thing that I need to be very clear on is what is the exhibit about? Mm-hmm. What what is what is this exhibit designed to do? Um, because the museum has thousands of beautiful things in the exhibit, so how am I going to decide what should go in my exhibit? And once I've gotten clear about what it's about, then I've got a very tough decision because I've got to think about lots of things that don't fit in my exhibit. I might love them. They might be really beautiful and valuable. Maybe I'll use them for another exhibit at another time, but they don't fit in this exhibit. So no, they're not going to be displayed in my exhibit at all. And then there are things that, okay, I'm going to put them in my exhibit, but they're not the main thing. They'll be off in a side room somewhere. If somebody's really interested, they can learn about that thing. And then there are the one or two or three spectacular pieces that are the focus of the exhibit, the thing you see when you walk into the Great Hall, the thing that goes on the poster for the exhibit. And I thought, what about if we were to think of our lives that way? First of all, what is my life exhibit about right now? What's What matters to me? What are my values? Where does my greatness lie? What do I want to be remembered for? All those kinds of things, which of course changes over the course of your life. It should. Mm-hmm. It'd be kind of sad if it's the same when you're 80 as when you're 20. Um, but what what's that for me right now? And then 
the next hard thing is, given that that's what my exhibit is about, what am I doing in my life that doesn't fit? It's not part of this exhibit. It doesn't belong. Maybe I'm never going to do it. Maybe I'll do it at another time. One of the things I did when shortly after my first son was born was I sat down and made a list of all the things I did before that baby was born that I wasn't doing anymore. There was a lot of stuff on that list. It's a lot of things. It's a lot of things. <laughs> and some of them I was kind of glad to get rid of. And others were things that mattered to me. And I would have liked to do them, but they didn't fit. They just didn't fit. Some of them I reclaimed later on. Some things were gone forever. So there are all these things you have to say no to. And that's not easy. Because, first of all, you may be sad yourself to let go of something. But also, sometimes other people are not so thrilled with your decision about what you're saying no to. So there's a whole bunch of negotiation that has to go on sometimes. But that's the first. Then the next piece is what I, you know, the things in the side rooms. So what goes into my exhibit? But it's not the main thing. It's not the most important thing. I have to do these things. They have to be in it. But I don't have to be great at them. I just have to be good enough. Just good enough is good enough. In fact, when I really want to bug people, I talk about embracing mediocrity. And the reality is that for all of us, many things, in fact, most of the things we do in our lives, we're just good enough. We, you know, of the, of the 100 things I do in a day, probably 85 of them are just good enough. And 15, I hope, are really excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so then we waste energy feeling guilty and bad about right. the mediocrity rather than saying, that's my choice. You know, my, I'm not an extraordinarily good housekeeper. My house is never going to be on the cover of Architectural Digest or, you know, one of the, 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 the home decor magazines. It's not filthy. And generally, like countertops are reasonably neat. But if you open a drawer, <laughs> heaven help you. If it's hidden, I don't care, you know? So that's mediocre housekeeping. I'm fine with that. That's not my greatness. That's not what I want to be remembered for. So that's the second piece. And that's really hard for most people. But if you do those two things, if you say no to the things that don't fit and you let yourself be good enough, then the good news is you have the energy to be great at the things that really matter. You will have that energy. And then you don't have to feel fried all the time because you're spread too thin. That's how curation works. Can we have a moment of silence? <laughs> that was incredible. And here's what I love. I mentioned at the beginning that you go to a level of depth and expertise and just thoughtfulness about each of those points that I've never seen someone else do. For example, you mentioned saying no. Lots of people, that's their advice. Say no, say no. What they don't talk about and why it continues to be something that, frankly, people don't put into action is no one talks about it. You go to this ad nauseum in your book. <laughs> How I loved it though. I needed that. I needed you to tell me in detail how hard it was going to be to say no. Because what we hear from people is when we tell them to say no, look at your schedule. There's so much on it. Look at your responsibilities. There's so much on it. You need to say no to something. They say, I can't. And so many times, and oh man, people are going to get mad. They're going to get mad and write to me, and that's fine. Because um, sometimes you just have to hear the hard truth. Sometimes that I can't response really is, I don't want to because it's really hard. And you need someone like you to say, I'm telling you, you still need to say no, even when it's difficult. Right. Right. It is difficult. I mean, for all kinds of reasons. There, there are the, the external reasons. This person is going to be disappointed mm. or they're not going to like me or it's really like it's a really meaningful thing and I ought to be able to to do, you know, there are all those. And then there's that voice in your head that says, you're such a loser. Mm -hmm. Everybody else figures out how to get this done. What's the matter with you that you can't fit this in somehow? You know, you're, you're letting people down. What a disappointment you are. 
you're doing it to yourself at the same time in many cases. And so learning how to deal with both of those things, both your own critical voice inside your head, what I call the obnoxious roommate Mm -hmm. who lives inside your head, and also developing the social skills to say no to people. Now, look, sometimes you can just say, no, go away. Don't bother me again. (laughs) You know, you're trying to sell me something I don't want. I don't know you. I don't have any obligation to you. Please quit calling me, you know, fine. But many times there's a relationship that I want to maintain. And I have to say no to somebody that I care about or I work with or who's my boss. And then that's about being able to do that in a way that respects the relationship, but makes it very clear that I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's where the skill set comes in. What's something that you had to say no to at some point in your career that was tough to say no to? Recently it happened. A few months back, a colleague whom I really like and respect came to me and said, "Uh, Gail, I'd like you to think about taking over the leadership of a professional organization. That's a big deal. That I'm a member of. And it's a good organization. And it was really an honor that he was asking me to do it. And I thought about it and I thought, gee, you know, I could do this and I could do that. And, you know, and then I thought, okay, Gail, you wrote this book. So listen to your own good advice. Does this fit into your exhibit right now? And I thought, well, my exhibit is about three main things right now. Keeping my business, this was during the pandemic, keeping my business going and and doing good work and making a living. Getting the word out about my book and selling my book, which I'm very invested in, and being the best grandmother I know how to be. Mm. Those are my three big things in my exhibit. So let's see. Will taking on this role help my business? Eh, Probably not, because the people in this association are people like me. If anything, they're my competitors. Will it help to sell books? Maybe a few, but no, this is not a big audience for my book. Is it going to help me be a better grandmother? No. In fact, it would probably take energy away from that. So I called him back and I said, look, I'm really honored, but I I can't, I don't have, this is one of my favorite phrases and I offer this out to you. I don't have the bandwidth to do that. Mm. Okay. It's a wonderful phrase. It doesn't apologize. It doesn't explain. It's not, I don't say to him because I want to hang out and play paper dolls with my grandchildren. You know, it says, sorry, don't have the bandwidth. Um, and and he was disappointed. But, oh, the other piece of that decision-making was, I thought to myself, am I okay with doing this mediocre? Mm. And the answer was, no, I'm not. If I take that on, I'm going to want to do it really well. And it doesn't fit in the exhibit. So no. There are some key pieces there that are so interesting. First of all, I can see how that decision was difficult because not only are you talking about uh, an organization that you're a part of, maybe there was the urge to give back. Uh You've got a colleague who you respect. So Uh there was the fear of probably disappointing that person Uh or them being upset. Right. But then also, how good does that feel if somebody says like, we want you. You're yeah. the chosen one to lead oh, this yeah. thing. And you're saying, no, that's yeah, so I can now, I can put that on my resume now, you know, president of such and so, right? Um, but again, you know, it wasn't, that, I mean, the, the reasons to do it were not compelling enough for me to do less of the things that really matter to me. Mm, I asked for that example because I wanted you to give one that would, and it was so perfect to resonate with this audience that when you're in the position of having to say no, and it feels so difficult and you feel like you can't, you just might be able to. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 But it's, it's, it, you know, it, I, I, one of the things I say over and over and over again in the book is nobody ever comes to me with simple problems. Mm. So if a problem looks simple, it's because I don't understand it yet. People have simple problems, they solve them themselves. So all of this stuff is complicated and hard. You know, if somebody says to me, um, you know, do you want to cut your lawn with nail scissors? You know, it's real easy to say no to that. I mean, (laughs) stupid and a waste of time. Why would I, you know? 
But it's the stuff like this where there's there's some appeal to it or some value to it. Other people would say yes to this. That's where it's hard. It is. And I love that you went there in the book because nobody does. They don't talk about how difficult it is. We just assume, mm-hmm. oh, there's friction there. I can't. I also love, there's this, this quote that we were giggling about before we hopped on to record. There's this quote that drives me crazy that is out in sort of the self-help, personal development literature. It's like, how you do one thing is how you do everything. Oh. Implying that there needs to be a level of excellence there across your entire life Otherwise, somehow you are failing and you use the word mediocrity in your book and it's so perfect. Embrace mediocrity in certain aspects. It's so good. Well, it's, it's, it's essential. And, you know, it's cultural. It's part of our problem is our culture, right? I mean, parents do not say to their children, oh, sweetheart, it's just fine to be mediocre at that. Mm-hmm. Right. We teach our children, do your best. If you're going to do something, do your best. Now, another phrase that drives me nuts is the good is the enemy of the book of the great. Mm. The good is not the enemy of the great. The good is the friend of the great, because if I let myself be just good enough at these things, that gives me the, the bandwidth to be great at the things that really matter. Yes. If I try to be great at everything, chances are I'm going to be great at nothing. Yeah. And here's the other issue. Um, You know, we blame social media for lots of things. Social media is amazing. Social media and this internet world is how I found you. And there are incredible things and assets out there about it. But if I feel compelled to have everyone close your eyes and picture that perfect pantry, the one where the person gets the beautiful white containers from the container store, everything is in its place. If I'm looking at my pantry and mine looks like a bomb went off in it, Mm -hmm. I can easily go to Instagram and find a person whose pantry looks like the container store pantry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I can find a person who is the perfect home chef and -hmm. their meals look and are immaculate and delicious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can also find the person who has built from the ground up bootstrapping, no investment money, built a billion dollar business. And isn't this incredible? I can find the best mom. I can find the most outdoorsy person. I can find the best athlete. Yeah. Physically fit. Yes. Right. And we Uh see that one element of greatness, that one central point of that person's exhibit. Right. And we don't see the side rooms. That's right. And and the and the storeroom where, where all the junk is that didn't even go in the exhibit <laughs> yes. at all. You're so you're so right. And look, I respect people's right to choose their own greatness. Mm-hmm. If having a beautiful picture perfect pantry is what matters to you, it, it makes your life feel good, then then do that. I, I don't criticize that. It's not my thing. But heck, if it's yours, then that's what you should do and figure out what else doesn't belong in your exhibit so that you have the time and the energy to keep your your pantry immaculate. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it, it's not for me a judgment call about this is how you should be spending your energy, but it is about when you figure out what matters to you, then do that and don't don't hold yourself to those unreasonable standards. The other thing about social media, is it has intensified a mistake that so many of us make, which is comparing my own insides to other people's outsides. Mm, tell me more about that. Sure. So early in my career, there were there were other people that I looked at that, I mean, it was clear that they were doing it all. You know, their home was beautiful. They were beautifully dressed when you went to their house for dinner. The food was wonderful. Their children were all, you know, A plus students in school, you know, and they were running a billion dollar company or something like that. And I would look at this and feel so inadequate. And then a couple of things happened. One was I began to realize that people were looking at me and thinking that I was one of those people Mm. who had it all together, who was doing it all. And meanwhile, I knew what a train wreck I was inside, (laughs) right? I mean, how many things I was cutting corners on and how inadequate I felt so much of the time. And then in my work as a therapist, which was the first half of my career, 
I began to have all these clients who were those people who looked as if they had the whole thing together. And I would hear their pain. I would hear their sense of inadequacy. I would hear their exhaustion. And I would think, holy cow, you know, how people look on the outside is not how they're feeling on the inside. Mm -hmm. And don't compare your own insights to other people's outsides. It's a losing game. It'll just make you feel lousy. So don't do that. That's so profound. And we do, we do that all the Mm -hmm. time. We assume, and part of it is just that, right? We get very wrapped up in our own situation. We have a hard time thinking about the complexity and the nuance that another person might be going through. But I don't, we don't have to understand maybe the details that that person is dealing with, but I think it's a pretty safe assumption that every single one of us has a backstage that other people are not aware of that is infinitely more complex than you would realize. Totally. And you know, what just popped into my mind is um, leaning in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Cheryl Sandberg. Carol Sandberg. She tells a story in there of how she used to put her children to bed in the evening in their school clothes. So that when they got up in the morning, they were already dressed for school. That, I'm sorry, that is pretty mediocre. That your kids are sleeping in their clothes and then going to school in those stinky clothes they wore all night in bed. You know, that was my reaction to that. And I thought, God bless you for telling us. Mm -hmm. Because you are this woman who's doing it all. And I would expect you to dress your children in designer clothing that were fresh from the cleaner every single morning. Or no, you had washed them by hand with stones in the stream. You know (laughs) what I mean? (laughs) And so, I mean, that's the truth. We're all we're all cutting corners. We're all letting things fall through the cracks. We're all doing things mediocre. Some of us are better at keeping that facade than others. But Mm -hmm. So again, instead of feeling guilty and inadequate about that, say, yeah, that's my choice. I let my kids sleep in their clothes. It makes life easier in the morning. Yeah. Well, what I love that you just modeled right there too is something that um, we talk about a lot around sort of our automatic like knee-jerk reaction versus the one that we are more deliberate about. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so honest to say that knee-jerk reaction is like, are you joking? You're putting your kids to bed in their school clothes, but then you deliberate a little bit on it. You think a little bit more and it's like, yeah, there's probably some stuff going on there. So as we're saying, there's this, this behind the scenes backstage that people aren't privy to your knee-jerk reaction might still be to assume that that person has it all together, but Mm -hmm. for just a moment, consider that there's probably a lot that you don't know about. There's another piece too in what I just said, which is, look, I reacted to her statement about how she lets her kids sleep with judgment. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what? And people do. Yep. We judge each other. Now we don't judge each other as much as people think we like people are not judging you as much as you think. Frankly, they're thinking about a lot of other things rather than you and what you're doing and not doing. But having said that, sometimes people judge. And sometimes people won't agree with your choices and they'll think she should be doing more of this and less than that. You know, if you're going to lead a curated life and you're going to be great at the things that matter to you, you got to, you got to accept that not everybody is necessarily going to agree with your choices all the time. Yeah. We were talking before we jumped on to record about life design and what we practice within Peak Mind. And one of the, we have these principles of life design. And one of them is that it, it again sounds very surface level, but there's more, there's a something profound underneath it that you are at the center of your life. Mm-hmm. And when I say that to people, they're like, but wait, I have kids and I have a spouse mm-hmm. and I have a team at work and a boss and whatever. And I'm like, right. And they have their own lives. Mm-hmm. The same agency that I'm asking you to take an intention that I'm asking you to take, they are invited to do the same thing. Yeah. And in where that judgment comes from, I think, is this desire to have agency. And what if we could just redirect that to our own situation? Like, let's focus. You talk about managing energy. Let's focus that energy on yeah. cleaning up our own exhibit and yeah. making it work for us. I just love totally. that. You know, another twist on that, and this is something I often use when I'm coaching executives, is 
one of the most important assets of your business is you. Yes. You know, you take very good care of your intellectual property. You take very good care of the machine or you take very good care of the of the computers and you take, you know, because these are important assets. And if they break down, your, your business is going to be in trouble. And if you break down, your business is going to be in trouble. So you see, in the same way that in your personal life, designing your exhibit, your design around you, you are the center. I think the same thing is, in a sense, is with that notion of seeing yourself as a really valuable asset in the work world that has to be taken care of and focused appropriately on the most important tasks. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure we close that loop, right? Because we've now thought about what our exhibit is about. We've Mm -hmm. said no to the things that it's not about. We've figured out what's kind of getting aside Uh, going sort of to the side of the stage and really what that then leaves room for are the small number of things that we'll be great at. Yes. Yes. And how wonderful is that to be able to, to be great. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when I'm talking about greatness, I'm not necessarily talking about fame. I'm not necessarily talking about making, making lots of money. There are people who are famous for what they're great at. There are people who are famous for terrible mistakes they made. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are lots of people who are great that will never be famous. I mean, my, my, my goal of being a really great grand, a a wonderful grandmother, I'm never going to be famous for that. I mean, there's not a grandmother of the year award that I'm applying for. The, The greatness will come in smaller in smaller ways and be measured by smaller things. Mm -hmm. So figuring out what your greatness is. And to me, that's about your talents. What are you good at? Your opportunities, what's available out there for you to do. You, I mean, I might be very good at, you know, deep sea fishing and I live in a desert, so I'm not going to be able to be a great deep sea fisher person where I am. Um, So talents, opportunities, dedication, Am I willing to work really, really, really hard at this? And passion. What what takes my energy but also energizes me? That's that's where you find your greatness. Something that I think is also interesting in the work that you do is you do a lot of work with leaders. Mm -hmm. And when I think about leadership, there's right the the more narrow, specific, probably typical way of describing it where you are a leader of a team, you're a business owner, entrepreneur, something like that. Right. And one key piece of a leader is that there's a role model element there. Yes. That element I see coming in with regard to parents modeling for kids and yes. maybe a friend who is someone who's looked up to within their circle, modeling for other people. When you think about people in leadership positions, you talk in the book and and, and have mentioned that there are, this goes even a step further when yeah. you're in that role model position. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, the, certainly that the role model piece is a big part of this, that people look to the leader that he or she is embodying what they want from their people. You know, I mean, to me, one of the bad mistakes to make as a leader is to send emails at, you know, 1030 at night or 530 in the morning. Now, I'm an early bird. I might be at my computer by six o'clock in the morning, but I'm not sending you an email at six o'clock in the morning because of the message it sends, which is why aren't you already at your desk? Mm -hmm. You know, I am. Why aren't you? So there's that aspect of it. And Leaders have to be aware of how much other people are watching and taking their cue and reading into their gestures, their words, their tone of voice, all of that stuff. We are very visible when we are leaders. But the other piece, I think, that goes even further, and sometimes this almost sounds a little patronizing, is that sometimes I kind of have to protect my people from their own tendency to push Mm -hmm. themselves too hard, too fast, too far. Mm -hmm. And this is things like telling people that they have to take their vacation days. Mm -hmm. You know, no, I'm not, I don't want you to roll them over to next year. You need your vacation this year, take it. And, you know, 
I don't want to see you in the office on one of your vacation days. That kind of, you know, insistence that people curate their lives. One of the business leaders I worked with, he had actually come up with a model for helping his people prioritize their work that was almost identical to the curating your life model. And one of his people heard me giving a speech and said, oh, you got to go talk to my boss. And I ended up working with him and his team around this model that he had, which was work that is strategically important, work that is necessary, but not strategically important, and work that is neither strategically important nor necessary. It matches up very nicely. Mm -hmm. And it has the same challenges in terms of how do I, somebody comes to me and says, we want you to do this work. And I say, I'm not going to because it's not important right? Got to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. So that business leader was doing a really good job of helping his team learn how to curate their work lives. Mm -hmm. And I see that as a big, if you want to be the leader of a peak productivity team, a team where you have the best people working at their best, getting the job done at an excellent level, you got to help them curate. That's how you're going to get there. I love that. I love that so much. And I think it's one of those points where we can even expand it out. We should hold each other. We should hold within our close circle, right? Where we kind of have more visibility into what's going on, hold ourselves accountable for saying, you know, you know, it feels like you've got a lot on your plate or, you know, having that more open dialogue that we talked about just a moment ago that just doesn't happen between what's on the outside and what's on the inside and what people might be struggling with that we don't know about that more open dialogue is just important. I, I hope folks listening to this, I hope you can understand why I was so thrilled when I came across Gail on this other podcast, I just instantly started Googling and looking for her. I'm like, I can find this woman. I can get her on this podcast because her book is so amazing. You are one of those rare people who has a deep, what we didn't talk about is that, and, and you mentioned it a little bit, the whole first half of your career, you were a clinical psychologist, right. did therapy. You have a deep understanding of the field. And you also have this, this, um, unique application of it now in this new or second chapter of right. your career right. with all of that experience, with all of that expertise, how do you think about psychological strength? You know, it's a big, psychological strength is a big concept. And I think there are a lot of pieces to it. Yes. I also think it means different things for different people at different times. There's one thing my work has taught me is that most generalizations don't, you know, they don't apply all that. Certainly. Way. The, the piece that is top of mind for me, and I don't pretend this is the whole thing, but one of the keys to psychological strength is feel the fear and do it anyway. Mm. Now, there are the times you feel the fear and you shouldn't do that thing because it's really stupid and dangerous, so don't do it, <laughs> right? <laughs> but in many cases, there are things we are capable of, things that are going to be powerful, things that are going to open up new possibilities, or things that just really have to get done and I have to be the one to do it. And I'm scared. And I have to just do it anyway. And I think most of the really, really powerful things that have been done in this world why were done by people who were afraid and, and do it anyway. What leapt into my mind just now is that film, The King's Speech, mm -hmm. where the King of England had this very, very painful speech impediment. And, and for him, it was incredibly anxiety provoking to have to speak in public. And he gave some of the most inspiring and powerful speeches that kept his country going when they were you know, being bombed to oblivion in World War II. What yeah. a great example of feel, feel the fear and do it anyway. I love that. I could keep you on this recording for hours because <laughs> I could drill in to so many rabbit holes that I'm like, we can't go there because we need to make sure that people fully understand this concept. Um, where can people find you? Where can they get your book? I, I've read it. 
every word in that book. And it was so wonderful. I literally used your, as I reached out to you, I told you, I said no to a couple of things that were coming up because they just didn't fit. And it would have been unlike me. I would have just figured out how to make it happen. So I can't speak highly enough for it. Where can people find your book and learn more? Thank you. Well, I worked very hard to make myself easy to find. So I (laughs) hope that is the case. Um, Gail Golden Consulting is my website. And that has lots of content about who I am, about the book, about presentations, about other topics that I'm interested in. So so that's a good spot. I'm on LinkedIn, so you can find me there. The book, as you said, is called Curating Your Life. It's available. It isn't available in bookstores, but through online booksellers, Amazon and other online booksellers. Um, it's available as an Audible or and as a, a what's it called, called when you read it on the screen? Kindle. Or as a hardcover. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's out there. Um, and I would be thrilled and delighted. I put a lot of myself into that book and it was exciting because it enabled me to weave together the decades that I spent as a therapist with the decades that I have spent as a coach and a consultant and to see what the common ground is in the humanity of the people across all those hours of listening and talking with people. So I hope that people find the book useful. That was my intention. Oh, it was so wonderful. And this conversation has been incredibly thoughtful and just exactly what I was hoping that we could bring to this audience. Thank you so much for willing, being willing to be here and for sharing your expertise and your background and this incredible method with us. It was so great. Well, thank you. Thank you for your great questions. It's been really intriguing to to engage with you around all of this. I appreciate the opportunity. So thanks again. It's a simple fact that nearly everyone in the world could benefit from building psychological strength, but not everyone will put in the time and effort to do so. But today you did. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Building Psychological Strength. Now, if you're interested in building the mental toughness, confidence, and resilience you need to thrive through life's ups and downs, visit us at www.peakmindpsychology.com. Also, if there's someone in your life who could benefit from this episode, please share it with them. And if you yourself found this episode valuable, meaning if you took away even one insight that you can use to build psychological strength in your own life, we would so appreciate it if you would drop us a rating and a review on iTunes. The thing is, the more ratings and reviews we have, the easier it is to get this powerful and important content out to the people who need to hear it. Remember, your mind can be your most valuable asset or your biggest liability, and you get to choose. So choose wisely, my friend, and I'll see you next time on Building Psychological Strength.